Hi guys. <laughs> Welcome to the Autism Spectrum Disorder Seminar. We are so thankful that you guys are all here. Thank you for coming today. Um, just to start off, um, I kind of wanted to go over the fact that next month is Autism Awareness Month. So we are kicking off Autism Awareness Month by being here, getting some education. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Shelly. I know most of you, but if you don't know me, I'm Shelly. I work in day surgery, um, and I'm a nurse there. I am also the mother of Jalen, who is autistic. So this is Jalen. So he's nine years old, and he was diagnosed about four years ago. Um, Jalen is a very happy, affectionate, energetic, smart, and playful boy. If you were to see him out on the playground, you wouldn't even know that he has autism. Coming to the hospital or going to the doctor is an issue. So we all know this. Even neurotypical children, they have issues coming to the hospital. It's scary. Um, for an autistic child, it's very different. Um, they are dealing with a lot of different things that healing dudes are going to go over. But um, with that, um, it, it's very hard for families and our family living. So the idea of a better process um, came about. And that's what you are here for, which is George's past. That's when I approached Haley, who um, has been amazing. She's been amazing to our family. She is our lighthouse, our angel, this person right here. So um, I approached her about some education to come and talk with you because I don't know how you guys had it or how when you guys graduated from nursing school, but back when I was there, we barely touched autism. The CDC just released its new data. We are now 1 in 68. 1 in 68 children now have autism. That's, wow, you know? One in 42 boys has autism. My boy has autism. So, we are Children's Hospital of Central California. We need to be prepared, we need to be educated, we need to know how to care for these families. We need to be that place where they can come and say, hey, you know, they know, they know what they're doing. They're trained. When we go there, we're gonna have a great experience. And the goal of all of this, the goal of it all, is for kids like my son, other kids out there, the one in 68, to walk out of here and their families to say, oh, I'm so glad I was there. Now is a great time to introduce Haley and Jason. So Haley is our, is our person that we have at home. She is our lighthouse for my son, Jamie. She is actually, her and her team have worked with my son for four years. When the world was telling us no, she was telling us yes. And she, when they were telling us you're not going to be able to do this or that, she was telling us practice for a car, we'll do it. We have social stories for restaurants and church and airplanes, so now we take trips everywhere. We are Disneyland every month. <laughs> and we, and because I want my son to experience this world, and she has allowed that to happen. So outside of that, Haley Heitzig is the clinical coordinator for Holden Beck and Associates for Central Valley, as well as an instructor at Fresno State. Jason Marshall here is a clinical director of Big Central California. They are both board certified behavior analysts. So what does that mean to us guys? These are autism experts here to educate us. All right. Well, after that introduction from Shelly, I kind of wish she could give the whole presentation. <laughs> it's, it, it's very different. Um, Haley and I have both been working with children with autism for over 10 years. Um, Haley by plan, me by accident. Um, when, when I started my field of study, I didn't realize what a big part of my life autism would become. Um, but it has, and it's the majority of the kids we work with are somewhere on the autism spectrum. Uh, Haley's practice normally focuses on the younger kids, uh, 18 to three if she's lucky. I usually get the kids who missed early intervention. Some of the progress Shelley was talking about is spectacular. We see it often. But as we're going to talk about when we talk about diagnosis, sometimes diagnoses are missed for whatever reason. And when they're missed, sometimes the kids are five, six, I just last week got a 17-year-old who was diagnosed about two years ago. He was in the doctor's office, in the psychiatrist's office at 18 months. And he had missed a lot of his developmental milestones. But at the time, the psychiatrist just wasn't comfortable diagnosing autism. It was kind of a, a death sentence, if you will. There wasn't treatment. There wasn't a lot of information about it. And so he, told, he didn't tell the family, come back in a couple years, let's see. Instead, he gave them explanations. It could be this, it could be that, don't worry about it so much. 
The family ruled out autism at that point. They just decided that's not what this is. This is something else. So they spent years seeking genetic counseling, uh, talking to experts for every type of intellectual impairment out there. And then they decided when he was 16, well, we might as well go back and see because nothing is explaining this. And then he got a diagnosis of autism. He's a 17-year-old who is not potty trained, who has no functional communication. He has no real way of communicating with his family. He grabs them by the hand and he pulls them places. If they don't guess what he wants, he tantrums. He'll hit himself in the head. He'll drop to the ground and hit his head on the ground until his family, the people who love him the most, can guess what it is that he wants. Um, that's a tough way to live. That's a tough way to raise kids. I was involved with the raising of children with autism before I had my own kids. Having my own children now, it's so different. I didn't realize, because it's just what we did. We use social stories. We use visual schedules. We use all the tools that we're going to talk about today. That's how I interacted with kids. Now that I have my own kids, a lot of those strategies are still in play. We still use them if something big and scary is going to happen, and it works just the same. So although we're talking about autism today, these are going to be tools that you can use everywhere with any child. Um, so our objectives today is that we want to talk, we want you to be able to explain by the end of our presentation what autism is, identify how the characteristics of autism spectrum disorder, ASD, impact behaviors in the hospital setting. This is one of the most challenging places that, for kids to be. I was making a joke earlier that I walked in and I was perfectly comfortable with this right until they put this wristband on at security. My blood pressure went up, I started breathing a little bit heavier. <laughs> Hospitals are anxiety inducing places even when you're walking in to, to just talk to a group of professionals. And then we also want you to be able to identify the intervention strategies that we can use in this new process that has been developed and how they'll help provide a better experience for families and children. I'd like to, before we get into kind of all of this, Shelley already covered this, but I'd like on behalf of Haley and I both to thank you for bringing us in to be a part of this. As far as I know, this is the only hospital in the Central Valley in the area between probably San Francisco and LA who's taking this step. They're going out of their way. <laughs> they're, they're cutting edge. They're coming out. They're going out of their way. All of you are going out of your way to improve service. This is the area where most families call me. This is where a lot of my initial contact with families comes in. It can be anything from having wisdom teeth extracted to major surgery. And the families are terrified. They have no idea. They can't get their kid through a grocery store in a five minute trip and they're looking at needing to bring their child to a hospital where they're going to have to be with strangers potentially all day, sometimes overnight. That's a big change. And so what we're going to cover today is first just characteristics of autism and what you're going to see when these clients come in. How, quick show of hands, how many of you know that you've worked with a patient with autism? You guys are all pros. All right, so we're going to cover that. The things I talk about, the examples I give, um, if you have something else to add where, or a particularly good story, we'd love to hear it as we go through. Um, so as I said, we've covered that. So depending on the age of the child when they come into the hospital, they were diagnosed one of two ways at this point. Either they were diagnosed under the DSM-4, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 4th edition, um, or if it was after 2013, they may have been diagnosed with the DSM-5. I've seen kids pretty recently diagnosed who are still being diagnosed with the DSM-4. So you'll see a noted difference between the two. In the DSM-4, this is where our, our identification of a spectrum disorder came in. When you look at autism in the DSM-4, they have four other subcategories. They have four things kind of under that heading. So they have autistic disorder, they have Asperger's, which is a high-functioning kind of form of autism. That's a, a very gross oversimplification, but it's the best I can do. Childhood disintegrative disorder, which is probably the most severe. And then the kind of catch-all umbrella of PDD-NOS, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. I don't know how you feel as medical professionals, but the not otherwise specified tends to bother me when I see that come across my desk. Um, and under this, they'd have six or more characteristics off a checklist. If they met those criteria, then they could be diagnosed as having autism. In May 2013, the DSM-5 was finally released. We were waiting for it for a while. It finally came out. Um, and at first, I think a lot of us were a little apprehensive because we saw some of the terms we were very familiar with disappear. They don't talk about Asperger's anymore. 
They don't really talk about childhood disintegrative disorder, but it's all kind of under this umbrella. So it's, it also, I know that when we were diagnosing under the DSM-4, we were seeing a lot of kids being diagnosed earlier and earlier, which as Shelley in, uh, mentioned, early intervention is key. When we get them young, there's a lot fewer skills that we need to catch them up on and they're much more likely to be successful. The outcomes are much better the earlier we catch them. Haley would call me cheering about how young some of the kids she got uh, were that when she got them. And with the DSM-5, it's kind of more difficult to diagnose them that early. Some of the diagnostic criteria aren't as readily uh, visible until they're in more complex social situations. We're looking at preschool or a daycare kind of situation. So there's five kind of categories, if you will, under the DSM-5 diagnosis. First, there has to be a persi persistent deficit in social communication and social, social interaction across a bunch of different environments. This can be social-emotional reciprocity, a deficit in f sharing or being able to kind of read other people and how they're feeling at the moment. It can be a deficit in nonverbal communicative behavior, so not saying mommy until he was five. We also have deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. Um, this can be siblings not really understanding uh, the value of having a brother or sister. Not playing, uh, imaginative play, peer play. On the playground we see often a lot of what we call parallel play. They're playing and if you didn't know, if you don't look too closely it looks like they're having a great time. But then you realize all the other kids on the playground are engaged in a game of tag and our kid is sitting, sifting through the sand and putting in a bucket and dumping it. Or maybe he's running right alongside them, but he's never interacting. And I keep saying he, as Shelley indicated, the, the prevalence is now five to one. For every five boys, there's one girl. So often I just use he because that's the number that, or that's the, the way the stats are falling out. So the second category outside of the social communication area is you see restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior. For those of you who have worked with kids with autism, this can be rocking as they're waiting. It can be hand flapping. It might be um, really, really isolated interests. I don't know why trains are such a powerful thing to our kids with autism, but the vast majority of kids I've worked with, if you, they could have anything in the world, it would be a train. Maybe followed by a fire truck. Those seem to be the two big things that people are really excited about. Um, Sometimes it's drawing, sometimes it's a certain cartoon, but they don't have the wide range of interests and, and desires that typically developing kids might have. They're narrowly focused and they tend to be experts in that area of interest. I've been lectured to more times than I can imagine about how the internal workings of a train operate. Um, I think I had a child with autism actually explain the internal combustion engine to me for the first time ever. And it was a surprise to me, and he was very accurate, I might add, down to the physics of how it worked. So this can look like stereotyped or repetitive movements or use of objects. Sometimes it can be a hand flap. It can be twisting a bracelet or a watch. It can be a certain kind of hand gesture that they make. Sometimes it's lining up toys, flipping objects, or it can just be a delayed kind of repetitive phrase that they might say over and over and over. Um, also presents with an insistence on sameness. This can be, and this is what makes hospitals particularly challenging for a lot of our families. The kids, be, maybe they have a hard time out in public. The easiest way for some families to cope with a child who doesn't deal well out in public is to not take them out in public. So you have families who do everything they can to avoid having to leave the house. If you've got a kid who really likes sameness, really likes routine and structure and things not changing, of course it's going to be hard for them to leave the house. And if it's hard for them to leave the house to go see grandma, it's going to be really, really hard for them to leave the house to come here. Uh, we talked about highly restricted and fixated interests. The other important thing, variable that's going to come into play in a hospital setting is hyper or hypo activity to sensory input. This can be a, an, a very severe sensitivity to things like lights or sounds um, or textures. And this isn't by any means all kids on the autism spectrum, but a number of them will have this issue. As we start talking about some of the techniques that we're going to put in place, you'll see how this comes into play. 
Sometimes it's an indifference to pain or temperature. Sometimes you can, um, I've worked with kids who have fallen on the playground and literally broken bones. And they get up and they keep playing and they run like nothing's wrong. And the parents, it's hard as a parent to know what to do because you, you don't even recognize that your child's hurt. Your child doesn't even recognize that they're hurt. Other times with other kids somewhere on the spectrum, they can get a splinter and it's the end of the world. It's, it's crying, it's, it seems like an over the top reaction, but it's just a difference in their sensation, their sensory system. It's not something that we can see, it's not something that we can predict, but when we're looking at kids with autism, it's things we look for. The more you see it, the more you'll know what kind of kid you're dealing with. And so de despite DSM-4, DSM-5, or what we'll talk about in a second, which is an educational diagnosis of autism, there's some core deficits. These are the things, this is what autism looks like. These are the characteristics. There's almost always a deficit in language. It could be expressive language, which would be the ability to speak. Sometimes it's receptive language. They don't really understand what other people are saying. You can't really confuse the two because some kids have echolalia. So they talk, they repeat sounds and words often. Sometimes they'll repeat whole episodes of their favorite cartoons. But they have no idea what they're saying. They don't know what it means. I've worked with kids who have told me, I love the beach, I love the beach, I want to go to the beach. And then you take them to the beach and they don't even know where they're at. They, they don't recognize the connection between the words they're saying and the object itself. Other times, I, I've got a kiddo right now who is completely nonverbal. He doesn't even make sound. I think he says happy, but it's not because it's a word happy. It just happens to be two sounds that he was able to put together kind of randomly. I don't know. He's, he's made that. He said that word his whole life, um, but it's not ever used in context. However, we, we worked with him to develop some assistive communication. He uses an iPad and Proloquo to go. And his receptive language is almost age appropriate. He really does seem to understand everything that we've said to him. He doesn't always do it because he's a teenage boy and doesn't always want to follow directions. But the understanding, the comprehension of the language is completely intact. And once we got around him having to use his own voice, he's able to communicate with us very effectively in complete sentences. And he's a funny, polite young man now, we've discovered. So language deficits, eye contact is another kind of no-brainer. This is an obvious sign. But kids who are shy also have a hard time with eye contact. So it's not, it's not a, a standalone kind of diagnosis or diagnostic tool. Um, but you might see this when you're pointing at something, you're trying to alert or identify a child of something that's going to happen. I've seen I've had a number of clients here during uh, rehab services, and a nurse might approach them and say, this is what we're looking at when we're taking your vitals. And she's pointing at a machine that's got numbers on it, and it's making noise. And the kid doesn't turn to look at it, even though that's clearly what the nurse is talking about <coughs> and trying to direct his attention towards. Um, that lack of joint attention, that lack of them being able to share an event with you, to look at something and, and and understand it the way that you understand it is often lacking. Deficits in social interaction, they just, they, they're not interested in hugs. They're not interested in talking. Um, I had a, a student who, or a child who was very interested in dogs. So if I showed him a picture of my dog, wow, he was excited. And he would sit and talk with me about my dog forever. He wanted to talk about the breed, where it originated from, all kinds of things. But if I showed him a picture of my kids, he didn't care. wasn't interested at all. Um, if you ask them how their day went at school, they don't really want to talk. They might say, I want chips now. <laughs> I want a snack. I'm done. So deficit in social interaction, hand flapping, rocking. Um, sometimes skin picking is one that I'm seeing more and more lately, where it starts as just kind of a dragging their nail across their finger. And then if it causes a scab, they might keep picking at it. Um, and then the rigidity, the inflexibility of routine, ritualistic behaviors, um, the, the, the expectation and the, the absolute demand for sameness. So some kiddos who might come through, they have, let's say they come here for a relatively minor quick visit. And the next time they come in, if they don't see the same people in the same order at the same time, they're going to be very anxious, very upset. You're going to see a lot of rocking and a lot of discomfort just as a result of it not being the same. And then you, we also see 
despite which tool we use to diagnose, a deficit in symbolic or imaginative play. One of the, the top things that I work with, with older kids, is to teach them recreational skills, leisure skills, because they don't have them. They don't know how to play. They might be more than happy to sit in a corner of their room and shred a paper towel and watch the little pieces fall. They might find a string or pull the string out of things, and they can do this for hours. But if you hand them a toy and you say, let's go play, they don't really play. They might turn the car upside down and start spinning the wheels to watch the wheels spin, but they're not playing with it the way that other kids would play with a toy car. So our stats are all completely off because as of Thursday, a couple days ago, the CDC released all new stats. And so as Shelley said, it's one in 68. I found a really alarming number. South Korea, actually, their medical system seems to be diagnosing a little bit more thoroughly. And I'm, I don't know why, I just came across this stat. But in South Korea, they're identifying one in 38 children as having autism. And I read from an expert saying that he thinks that the 1 in 38 number is probably closer to the, what we're eventually going to find in the United States, but we're, just not, we're still not catching them all. We're still not identifying them all because the way the CDC measures this stuff is kids receiving treatment, kids with a diagnosis. It's not identifying the total number. It's just telling us which ones we've identified. It's the fastest growing developmental disability, and again, these numbers are higher now. Every number I'm going to give you is now higher. The situation is now a little bit more dire than it was Wednesday. So uh, the number I saw recently was closer to 30% annual growth. It was 1 in 88, I think, two years ago, and now we're at 1 in 68. It's five times more prevalent in boys, 1 in 54, although I think that number is different, and one in t I know the 1 in 252 is different. But as you can see, it ha it's <clears throat> more common in boys than in girls. In my personal experience, and I've read this a couple places, but girls with autism tend to see, seem to be a little bit more difficult. They seem to have a, a, a more um, behavior problems, more of the aggression, more of the self-injury. Don't know why. There's a lot of things we still have no idea about when it comes to autism. But five to one boys to girls, <clears throat> and parents with a child, one child with autism have it between a 2 and 18% chance of having a second child with autism. I've known a lot of families who have had a child with autism. They've had a second child. The second child had autism. I've also known families where the first child was typically, oops, typically developing. The second child has autism. More commonly, <clears throat> one child has autism. The second child has Something else. ADHD tends to be a common thing that runs in the family. Um, there's some preliminary evidence that schizophrenia and some other mental health disorders are somehow tied into the mix, but we really just don't know yet. Studies, interesting, I always love twin studies because it allows us to really look at the genetics involved. And unlike Down syndrome, which is a very genetically driven uh, disorder, it's not as clear cut with autism. Studies have shown that among identical twins, if one has it, the other's 30, between 36 and 95%. That's a pretty big range. Maybe a third of them will, minimum, but 95% in some cases. And it, but if non-identical, meaning their DNA is not perfectly matched, if one child has ASD, then the other one is between zero and 31% chance. So it seems like there's definitely something genetic going on there. And this number's exploded. I apologize for not having the most recent number. I just read the news story. I haven't actually looked at the CDC report myself yet. But between 1 to 1.5 million Americans are currently living with autism. And that number is significantly higher now. Some of the reasons why we're pushing early intervention and we're pushing hospitals to develop these skills. And I've worked with doctor's offices and a lot of different groups to try to help them, equi help equip them to deal with autism is because it's growing in number and the expense is increasing geometrically. So the cost of a life lifelong care for a person with autism can range from 3.2 to $5 million. This is just the amount of money that it costs for them to live a, live a normal life. Lifelong care is reduced by two thirds when we diagnose them early and they get early effective intervention. 
It's a $60 billion annual cost right now in our country, and 60% of these individuals are receiving some form of adult services. Early intervention hasn't been around that long. So it's no surprise right now that 60% of them are receiving adult services. Those of us who work in the field are, are fairly optimistic and confident that as quality early intervention is more easily accessible, that number is going to come down. Hopefully, by the time they're adults, they're not requiring the same level of care. They're not going to be requiring the same modified living circumstances. Hopefully, through intensive early intervention, they're going to be more independent. But the cost of intensive behavioral intervention programs, between forty dollars to $60,000 per year per child. So if you imagine the families I know who have two or three kids with autism in their family, this price tag gets pretty high. According to the National Institutes of Health, we're currently spending $30.86 billion. It's being allocated for treatment and for research. Well, that's a combined figure. And in 2012, $169 million was being funneled towards autism research. Anyone, there was a news story, New England Journal of Medicine just published, I think on Thursday as well, because it really kind of messed up my day, that they've done, <laughs> they've now identified that the individual with autism's brain first begins to show abnormalities in utero. So before we were kind of wondering at what point can we really, what's the earliest we can possibly know that a child has autism? And again, it's a preliminary study. It hasn't been replicated, but it's the New England Journal of Medicine, so it's fairly reputable. They found that in some of the inner layers of the cor brain cor neocortex, cortex, there's uh, obvious abnormalities being seen. They, when they looked at kind of a blind look at the autistic brain versus a typically developing brain, in some of the earliest developing parts of the brain, they were able to differentiate between which one was a brain of someone with autism and which one was a typically developing brain. So it's fascinating. I don't know what it means for treatment, but it's an interesting discovery to say the least. And it brings us to the fact that we don't really know a whole lot about autism. We know it's a big problem. And you'll see it's become kind of a celebrity thing. You'll see celebrities talking about and raise, trying to raise awareness. For those of you familiar with the vaccine issue, that maybe vaccinations are, are to blame, um, science doesn't bear that out. It just doesn't. But it, it's hard for us in the field because we can't point a finger and say that we know what it is. We can't give people a reason for why autism is increasing. And as a result, it kind of leaves the field open to people to come up with their own ideas. Is it genetic? It seems like there's a genetic component. Could it be environmental? Yeah, it seems like it, because when you look at the stats, certain neighborhoods, certain cities have a higher rate than other cities. It's probably both, would be kind of the, the, the safe guess where everyone's at right now. Is it possible that it's something we haven't even thought of yet? Yeah, that's a possibility too. We don't know where it's coming from. But what we do know, and for those of you who might be um, a little bit more senior in the audience, in the 60s, we, there was this, this idea that autism was being caused by refrigerator moms. By moms, and I don't know why moms always get the blame, but the blame was very much focused on moms who just weren't good moms. They didn't care enough about their children because if they cared enough, their children wouldn't be behaving the way they're behaving. And exhaustive studies have been done that indicate that parenting, behavioral intervention, which is often done by parents, can have an impact, but it's not a cause. You can be the most caring, wonderful mom in the world and still have a child who's very severe, severely affected by autism. So I just want to make, if any of you were still harboring that idea, it's, it's been disproven. And while we don't really understand exactly what's happening. This is a couple of references that look at people who are trying to find the answer. And what we're seeing is that it's most likely an interaction between genetics, some form of genetic predisposition, being triggered by or exacerbated by or a gene being activated by something in the environment. And I've seen a lot of different ideas. There are some studies that are looking at a byproduct of plastics and petroleum that looks kind of like um, DNA that can bond in utero possibly instead of um, actual genetic material that could be a, a result. There's obviously a lot of talk right now about pollution and the impact of pollution. There seems to be higher prevalence in kind of urban um, crowded cities. 
So that leads a little bit of credence. But again, as far as cause and effect, we just, at this point, can't answer the question. Um, it's unique in the sense that it's a purely behavioral thing. We don't, there is no blood test. There's no genetic test. There's no way that we can know for certain whether or not an individual has autism. So we have a lot of rating scales. We do a lot of looking and watching and testing to see what happens. And um, one of the first tests done, 0 to 36 months, is the MCHAT. I, I have to share the story. My son, when he was two, our firstborn child, I was at work. My wife calls me to tell me that the pediatrician just gave Jackson an MCHAT. And I, my heart stopped. And I thought, oh my goodness, why? What did he see? Why would he give my child an MCHAT? Does he think he's autistic? Because the only thing I'd ever heard in the context of the MCHAT was failed MCHATs. A failed MCHAT is one of the first signs that a child might have autism. But a lot of kids fail the MCHAT and they end up not having autism. But my wife still teases me about it because my reaction was classic. I was very concerned. Um, but it's 22 questions and you run through it. The pediatrician often might, it's parent driven. He's asking the parents. He's doing a couple observations in his office. Um, and it's kind of the first indicator. Oftentimes parents look back and they'll say, yeah, I knew something was a little bit off or, oh, I should have seen this. But hindsight's 2020. It, it doesn't seem like there's usually that obvious. Um, at the, it's not usually that obvious at that age. So we watch them, we look for communication, we look for behavior, developmental levels, we look for, are they interested in who the doctor is when he walks in the door? Do they orient towards strangers? Do they smile? All the things that typically developing little kids do, we kind of keep an eye on that. We have the behavioral tests, the CARS rating system, the chat, autism screening questionnaires. There's a whole industry now <laughs> built up around trying to identify this condition as early as we can because the evidence is so overwhelming that the earlier we catch it and start intervention, the better the outcome. We talked earlier for briefly about medical versus educational. Medical is a physician or psychologist, often or a psychiatrist, um, assessing symptoms, administering the diagnostic tests, and placing the label. And when it's a medical uh, team that does it, it currently should be according to the DSM-5. In education, um, it's made by a multidisciplinary evaluation team of school professionals. It's usually a special ed teacher, a general ed teacher, a school psych, a speech path, and maybe an occupational therapist, and a school nurse, generally. And they observe, they make some recommendations, and then in education, which is where I work, I've worked with a lot of children, you might see on their IEP autistic-like behavior, or ALB, written in under the what is it called, the qualifying condition for service. And it took me a while to realize that an educational diagnosis doesn't really mean much outside of education. So they would have a, an educational diagnosis of autistic-like behavior. And I would tell them, that's great. We need to get services for you. Let's go get started. And some of the funding agencies and service providers weren't really that interested until there was a medical diagnosis. So. Um, I personally push a lot of families to seek a medical diagnosis in the event that they get an educational diagnosis because it does nothing but open doors for services, for funding, for treatment. The best multidisciplinary teams include, and this is medical or educational, doctors, pediatricians, psychologists, speak and, speech and language pathologists, occupational therapists. All of these people are trained to know what range typically developing kids fall in and they're trained to spot when things are looking a little bit off. Once you've received the diagnosis from professionals, um, and this, this section is more to kind of give you an idea of where the families are at when they're coming in. There's a grieving period. I have several families that are going, the seven, family of the 17-year-old who just recently were, was diagnosed. To them, it was actually a relief because they've been wondering, why is our kid so different? What's wrong? Now they know. Now at least they have a, a label to put on it, and they have resources to research, experts to talk to. Often in, in early diagnosis, there's a grieving period. There's a period of families, and speaking from fairly recent personal experience, when you're pregnant with your children, your firstborn, secondborn, doesn't matter, you, you can't help but think what they're going to be like once they're born, 
once they grow up? Are they going to be doctors? Are they going to be, in my family, lawyers? Are they going to be scientists? What are they going to be? What are they going to do? Maybe they're going to be police officers. And for, in a lot of cases, once families get the diagnosis of autism, it, they feel like they've lost that child. That child that they were kind of idealizing and dreaming about, once the diagnosis happens, they feel like that's not even the same person anymore. Now I have this other kid who's completely different from the one that I imagined. Families also grieve for the loss of a normal lifestyle. You know, you, it's, it's difficult. Going to the grocery store can become something that you have to plan days in advance. There's a certain day of the week you can go to the grocery store, and that's the only day that you can go to the grocery store. Um, things that come up out of the ordinary, family vacations, um, having one of the, the worst situations is a death in the family and having to attend a funeral. Sometimes it can be a very close family member. It can be a grandmother or grandfather, and families won't go to the funeral because they're afraid that their child won't be able to handle it, that they'll ruin the situation. Weddings, same kind of situation. Weddings don't happen with any great degree of frequency in a family, but when they happen, it's a big deal, and people usually like to be there. If you have a child with autism, that suddenly can become really challenging and very anxiety producing. And sometimes um, it's just hard following a diagnosis to realize what is still capable, what, what, what you're still capable of, what the family is still capable of, and, and getting back to the fact that you can still have a great quality of life. And things can be normal. It just takes a lot of work. And I think. Haley being described as a lighthouse is a good indicator. It feels like often you're, you're rudderless. You don't know what to do. You've got this diagnosis. You, d you don't have any experts in the family. You don't know who to ask. Sadly, a lot of pediatricians aren't much help. Um, there, a lot of people are very hesitant to say that a child is autistic because once you say that, you trigger all this stuff, <laughs> the grieving period, the loss, the anger, the confusion, and it's, I think it's hard to be the person responsible for that. Um, further impact on the family, having a child with autism is a huge source of stress. It's tough because your kid can't talk to you. They can't tell you what they want for breakfast. They can't necessarily tell you that they have an earache. They can't tell you what they need or what they want. It's hard to teach them when there's a language deficit how to button their pants, how to put their socks and shoes on. Those things that you do with your typically developing children very easily. You show them once and then they've got it. A child on the autism spectrum, it's not like that. They're not going to pick it up that quickly, so you're going to have to show them a couple of times. Often there's a disturbance in sleep pattern. The number of families that I've seen who will tell me that their child hasn't slept in two days, that they're waking up at 3 in the morning and they're wide awake until 11 o'clock the following night. That's tough. That takes a huge toll on a parent when you're not sleeping. But how do you sleep when your child's wide awake and possibly roaming the house? That's not, <clears throat> it makes it very hard to sleep. It makes it very hard to have restful sleep. Social interactions, you have family over. Maybe you're having a family dinner. And your child wants nothing to do with grandma or grandpa. Sometimes they say things like, grandma smells funny because they're not looking at how the other person feels. They're just identifying, I smell something kind of funny and it's coming from her and that's the person I call grandma. <laughs> so that can be embarrassing. I have a, a family right now that the grandparents don't even want to be involved. They don't even want to show up and be around their grandchild because it's very unpredictable and they don't want to be the reason why he has a meltdown. They don't want to be the reason why um, the neighbors come over and ask if everything's all right. So they just, rather than be involved and try to help the situation, they just stay away. And I know from, from personal experience, if my, my father just decided to stay away from me, if he just said, you know, I love you, son, but I don't think I want to come over and see you, that'd be really stressful for me as a child, um, as his son. So that's a family stressor. And I can't stress enough just the community outings. Anything that you have to do out of the community, except maybe a few select things, like going to McDonald's, Going to McDonald's or any place that has chicken stars, Carl's Jr., right? I don't know why, what it is about chicken stars, but that's another big favorite, kind of like trains. Going somewhere where they're going to get chicken nuggets of some kind and french fries seems to go okay. But pretty much anything else 
tends to be very challenging and it takes a lot of prep work. And then the routines that need to be developed. They have an insistence, children have an insistence on sameness. So families often work really hard to keep things same. The morning routine is the same every morning. Sometimes it stays the same even on the weekends. You're waking up at the same time, you're getting dressed in the same way, you're having the same things for breakfast. Just because it's not worth it to have that fight on a Saturday morning. We keep everything the same, Monday through Sunday. Um, I know a number of very religious families who started forgoing church because church is another thing. It happens once a week. There's a lot of people there. There's sounds and there's lights and there's people and sometimes things happen that they don't really understand. Um, I, I've, I'm not personally Catholic, but I've attended Catholic church with some of the families that I've worked with. And when the congregation kneels, everyone's moving in unison to a social cue that all the adults in the room understand. Kid with autism has no idea why all of a sudden everyone's moving except him. And that can trigger some real anxiety, some real panic. Also going to sporting events where they do the wave, that's another one of those kind of big social events where everyone knows the wave, everyone knows how to do it, but when all of a sudden thousands of people start moving in unison and one of our kids doesn't really get it, it's a very frightening experience for them. And then often we have issues with finances, just adding to the stress. You've already got all these other things going on. You've got to take your kid constantly for evaluations to different therapy. Kids, just the average kid I know has between 15 and 25, sometimes more hours a week of in-home behavioral therapy. On top of that, they usually have speech therapy, just private speech therapy, maybe once or twice a week. Sometimes they have occupational therapy a couple times a month. Some families then add other things, social play groups, um, other types of speech uh, services, reading therapy, uh, trying to catch their kids up academically, academic tutoring. And the schedule just gets overwhelming. There's always something that they have to be at. There's always something that has to be done for one kid. So if they've got typically developing kids who want to play t-ball, baseball, soccer, how do you divide your time? How do you make it so that your child with autism gets all the best services available, but you're not neglecting the other kid? And no matter how balanced a family is and how great they are at ma managing all of those things, there's still stress involved. It's still, we're not doing enough. I don't feel like we're doing enough. If only we could do more and better. So families that you're gonna be dealing with are under this kind of stress, day in, day out, never goes away. It doesn't really change. We, they start worrying about what happens if I'm gone? What happens, I mean, every parent worries about how their children will, will thrive in their absence. But if you've got an adult child who's completely dependent on you, then what? So they don't know how to pay their own bills. They don't know how to find an apartment. They don't know how to find a job. They don't know how to manage money. They don't know how to manage their medications. Uh, in a perfect world, by the time they're an adult, with good early intervention services, they've got a lot of these skills or they've got a support network in place. But planning that all when you've got a newly diagnosed child is overwhelming and is very stressful. And then we add to that the hospital. So this is just normal life. This is every day. This is what they're going through. Now they have a child who needs to go to the hospital for a medical procedure. Maybe routine, maybe serious, maybe life-threatening. And we're asking this child who thrives on sameness, who loves his routine, who has very limited interests, only interacts with certain people, to come to an unfamiliar environment where there's all kinds of new rules, things that normally if he... How many of you are familiar with PECs? Anyone? There's little picture, picture icons that a lot of kids, nonverbal kids with autism might use to communicate. They pull off the icon of, let's, my favorite, you'll see it come up later. A lot of our kids seem to like um, Red Hot Cheetos. So they pull off an icon of Red Hot Cheetos, they hand it to mom, and most of the time in their history, it seems like an appropriate thing. Mom should give him some Red Hot Cheetos since he asked so nicely for it. In a hospital setting, maybe that's not an option. Maybe he really wants Red Hot Cheetos, but now he can't have them because he's not supposed to eat anything. It's busy, it's noisy, even in, in down times, except really late at night, hospitals are much noisier and louder and more um, busy than most environments that kids have to hang out in. And 
again, with a kid who is not really flexible, there's a number of transitions in a hospital setting. You see the security guard, you see the receptionist, you have to go through a whole bunch of different people, and before they can figure out any of them, they're on to the next person, new stranger, new face, new person that they don't know what to expect from. And that can cause, obviously, some stress. They're also often never separated from their family. I, I'm, the number of moms and dads I know who have never been away from their child with autism overnight or for a weekend, they don't feel comfortable leaving their special needs child with anyone. And now we're saying to the child, you're going to be with strangers, and your family's not going to be in the room. They're not, you're not going to see them for a while. Sometimes, if they have great language skills, we might be able to explain that to them quickly. Otherwise, it's going to be a stressor. Mom and dad are just gone, as far as they're concerned. And there's going to be just the, the general, all kids, fear of the unknown, fear of strangers. Um, and people in the hospital are going to be doing weird things. And I, not to disparage any of you, but you do weird things to kids from an autism standpoint. You make them wear weird clothes. You put weird things on them that squeeze them unexpectedly without a hug. It's just this other thing happening. Sometimes you poke them with needles. Sometimes you put them in rooms with bright lights and things that make a lot of noise. And sometimes they're in a room with other kids crying that they can't see, but they just know that they hear crying. All of those things are unique hospital stressors. Throw into that the, the general disorientation and pain from surgery. They're, they've had a procedure, or they need a procedure. Either way, they can be in physical discomfort and pain. If they're coming in, out of anesthesia, um, I don't deal well coming out of anesthesia, so it's even tougher for them. And all of those things are just new and added stressors unique to this environment. Things you're going to see behavior-wise, you may ask them something or direct them towards something, and they may not respond to you. This doesn't mean that they don't understand what you're asking them. It just might mean that they don't have the expressive language to, to tell you or explain to you. They may ask you the same question over and over and over again. Typically, if it's me, I answer it once, and then I kind of stagger my responding. If you answer it every time, you're going to get really tired of talking pretty fast with some kids. Or they may repeat a certain statement over and over and over again. And they may, if they have no means of communication, they communicate through their behavior. And when I say through behavior, it might mean grabbing you and pulling your hand towards something. It might be pointing at something on them and screaming. Rather than kind of jerk back and be concerned, try to look at those things as an ability, their attempt to communicate with you when they don't necessarily have the tools that we're used to seeing in children. And you may see, and you, you probably will see a lot of repetitive patterns of behavior, um, difficulty in transitioning from one group of responsible adults to another group, um, difficulty when they go from a dark room to a bright room or a bright room to a dark room, quiet room to a noisy room, um, or room with a monitor that doesn't make noise to a monitor that does make noise. And they often have a lot of anxiety and a, a very difficult time regulating their emotions. Once they're scared, they're going to stay scared for a while. It's, it's difficult to calm them down. Um, if they're angry at you, if they don't like you, it's difficult to undo that too. They're going to be angry at you at, for a while. So when we're looking at the overview of autism spectrum disorders, these are, this is what you're going to see. This is what you all, most of you have seen in the hospital setting in surgery. Now what, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back what we're going to talk about is George's pass and kind of this overall process that the teams come up with that's going to hopefully eliminate a lot of these things. We're going to try to streamline things. We're going to try to reduce the transitions, reduce the noise, reduce a lot of the things that we've kind of looked at as triggers of difficult behavior in kids with autism. Like I was saying earlier, I've worked with a number of kids who have been in this facility. This is where parents want to send their kids. This is where anytime there's an option presented to them, this is where they want to bring their children. And we, I was laughing because we were talking as we were putting this together about the places that I've had issues and they haven't been surgery. 
honestly. They've been the lab, they've been in rehab, they've been other places, but the same kinds of issues were present. It's, it's the way a hospital works. In surgery, it's just a little more intense. And so this, this great idea, originally we were calling it the Fast Pass, George's Pass, I love it. Um, it's just hopefully a system that we're going to put in place that's going to allow for kids and families to move through the process, minimizing triggers, minimizing disruptions, distractions, and challenges, and allowing you guys to do your job more quickly, more efficiently, more compassionately, and not to have you feeling like you did something wrong because the kid got really upset during your time with them. So obviously the autism part of this presentation was kind of right in my wheelhouse. That's kind of what I do every day. Medical terminology, not so much. So I might mispronounce some things. Um, some of the acronyms I had to look up because I had no idea what they meant. So I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to go with the acronyms and I'm not even going to try to say what they stand for. But so in George's Pass, the process starts in the clinic. And in the clinic, we're going to have the child identified, so to speak. This is the spot where we, you as a team, come to the realization that you're working with a patient who has autism. I'm sorry, I have to get to a certain page really quickly. So we have the spot where autism is identified and the team identified as that being a, a, the role of the surgeon. The surgeon gets a, a, an individual uh, file and this is the, the individual he, patient he's going to be performing surgery on and there's a diagnosis of autism in place. Once that's done, I'm not going to read each box of this because it's just a system, so I'm going to go through kind of the bigger points. So we, as a team, autism's identified. Once, that's, once the surgeon's identified it, the rest of the team, and all of you are part of the team, are going to be identified that the patient has autism. And the parents are going to be notified, in, notified uh, in order to schedule a private tour of the hospital. This is a great idea, and we're going to talk about it more um, as we get going. There's going to be a couple of things that are new to the system that I'm going to be, Haley and I both are going to be discussing. One is a preparation kit that is going to go home after the clinic, um, which is going to have tools to familiarize them with what's going to happen in the hospital um, in terms of process and people and, and sounds and activities. And there's also going to be an intake form that I'm going to talk about in just a second that is also going to be filled out that is going to give the team critical, hopefully, critical information on how to best work with the child at each phase of surgery. And then lastly, with, the, with George's pass, patients identified with autism are going to be given priority scheduling so that hopefully there's not much waiting around. There's not sitting in the waiting room waiting to be called back. They're going to hopefully be arriving and the process is going to begin very quickly. So this is, I apologize, we're going to hand these out uh, during the hands-on portion so that you can look at them are they in the packet? Okay, great. So you have intake forms in the packet. And these were, this idea began with a need to facilitate communication between all teams and phases of surgery so that you can share experiences with a patient from one group to the next. So that if in pre-op the team learns that something works really well, that can be passed along quickly and easily to the surgical team, the OR team rather than each team kind of having to figure it out on their own or see what works and doesn't work. On the <clears throat> intake form, a lot of the patient's name, the date of birth and procedure, we have a couple of ways to indicate quickly just via check, check mark how some of these key areas work. How do they communicate best? They might communicate fine with spoken language. Maybe they speak in complete sentences, complex complete sentences, Communication is not likely to be a big issue if that's the case. Some of our patients are only going to be able to communicate in pictures, PECs, what we talked about earlier, or maybe they have a communication device such as an iPad where they're going to be punching or handing you pictures of things that are their way of communicating. We have some kids who communicate very well. They can write, and they'll just write out what they need or type out what they need or want or to say. Um, other times that's not the case. Unfortunately, because 
We don't always catch every kid and diagnose them early. And each kid with autism is a little bit different. Sometimes you get the purely nonverbal kid who has no real functional communication, like the 17-year-old I was discussing earlier. They might, the only thing they might have is pulling your hand, grunting, or yelling. Those might be their, their go-to moves as far as communicating with you. All of that information can be identified in the how do I communicate best. Going to the sensory issues, those triggers that might cause uh, discomfort. We've included what would make my stay at CHCC better. Maybe if they have an aversion to bright lights, keeping the lights dimmed. If they're particularly sensitive to noise, keeping the noise down. And in some cases, any startled, startle or sudden movement can cause children to uh, behave inappropriately. And so there's also some children where the parents might indicate that you need to explain what you're going to do before you do it. Don't make sudden moves. Talk them through it as you go. And then this last section of this screen is what we would call uh, antecedents. This is if you're going to see particularly challenging behavior, aggression, self-injury. Um, these are some of the, the main reasons why we would see those behaviors. It might be because they wanted something in the environment and couldn't get it. Um, I have a kid right now who would absolutely want for his very own any computer screen that is seen in the process. And if he can't have it, he will ask nicely and then he will start banging his head back on a gurney or in a chair if he is denied it. That might be an issue. Um, if he brings with him a fidget or a toy or a blanket or a sticker or it can be anything, any item that is particularly important to him and you take that item away unexpectedly, maybe because you need to do something medically, but yanking that out of his hand could trigger uh, some behavior challenges. So again, startle, we want to kind of talk them through it and warn them. And then the other big one is if they're in pain or discomfort. Um, often kids will start out, most of the, the big self-injury that I, I've worked with started out with an ear infection. So they had an ear infection and their ear hurt and they would pull on it and it would kind of relieve pressure, kind of make it feel a little bit better. And then as the ear infection gets worse, they were putting more force and they were pulling and they were hitting harder. And then over time, no one wants to see a kid hitting themselves. So it started to serve a function of people coming and running and asking what's wrong. But it all started from pain and discomfort. Their ear hurt and they didn't have a great way of telling people, hey, hey, it's my ear, my ear hurts. So I know, I know personally, I tell every parent that if you see them start messing with their ear, take them to see a doctor. <laughs> take them to have their ear checked out to make sure it's not infected. Um, or in some cases that they stuck something funny in their ear and you didn't see it. So it's important to ask the families on this intake form, how do they communicate when they're in pain? Most families, most parents have some way of knowing that their child's in pain. And it might be a certain sound they make. It might be a gesture that they make. Um, it could be a way that they point, or it, maybe they have tears. Maybe the only sign that you know that they're in pain is that they start having tears in their eyes. A lot of the kids I work with are not criers. They don't cry ever. They don't cry because they're emotionally upset, because they don't really understand the whole emotionally upset part. But if they hurt, tears coming down their face. That might be the only thing that we see. And then there's also a spot to identify comfort things. These, we're, we're talking about these in a lot of different ways. Uh, from a scientific technical standpoint, we talk about them in terms of reinforcers. And these would be things that we give a kiddo following a behavior we want to see again. So if a kid does something really great and they really love spicy hot Cheetos, if they say they imitate me, I say do this and then they imitate me and clap their hands. If I wanted to reinforce that behavior, I'd give them a uh, spicy hot Cheeto because they love that in the hope that the next time I ask them to imitate me they're more likely to do it reinforcer it's often used interchangeably with reward reward is just something we give somebody when they did a good job doesn't really mean I want to see them do it more but I'm pleased with what they did so I give them a reward to parents it's often interchangeable so when you ask a parent I, I ask parents so what is your kid like Whatever they say, that's kind of what goes in the spot. Maybe it's trains, maybe it's a certain type of chip, maybe it's a certain blanket or a cartoon character, maybe they like stickers, maybe they like rubber bands. I have a kid who loves Band-Aids. 
he just, he always wants band-aids. He would have band-aids all up and down his arms if mom would let him. Um, those would be things that the, the child finds particularly motivating. Um, and then suggestions for things that need to happen or are likely to need to happen in the course of surgery. We would need to know their favorite clear liquid and what kind of cup they drink out of, if they have a favorite cup or if they drink out of a sippy cup. Um, if they have a particularly, particular communication tool, hopefully they're verbal. That's obviously the easiest. But if they have a PEX book, we want to make sure that we know that and that we have the tools available to them to communicate with us during the procedure. Um, or if they have an iPad or some other, there's a whole range of assistive technology devices that are voice output. They push a button and then the, the device talks for them. Um, if they use any of those types of things, we want to have them available. If they use American Sign Language, for example, um, hopefully someone on the team understands sign. We want to know their rewards. If they're reward specific to home, if there's a specific, for example, Hot Wheels car that they just love, the chances of the hospital having that Hot Wheels car, probably slim to none. You'd have to hunt it down. That would be something the family could probably provide. Um, a second family member to provide support as we go through the process. There are a couple of times where we indicate a role for two adults. There's always a way to do it with just one, but in an ideal situation to have a second adult body is a good idea. Um, <clears throat> and then if they've been sedated before, that's a big wild card in my experience is that people come out of sedation um, in a bit of an altered state. And it's always different. My brother, when he had his wisdom teeth pulled out, he came out of sedation and he was incredibly flirtatious and goofy. And he was actually a lot more fun to be around after <laughs> he came out of sedation. Um, my wife comes out of sedation and she's an emotional wreck. She'll just start crying, sobbing, and there's no consoling her. She doesn't know what's wrong. She's just a mess. Um, but once you know that, once it's happened, then you can kind of be prepared for it. My wife had her wisdom teeth out. She cried a lot. She was inconsolable. She had sedation uh, following one of her pregnancies, and I knew what to expect. So when she woke up weepy and upset, I didn't have the same kind of, oh, I've done something wrong. I, in my head, I was just thinking, oh, this is what she does. And so I could help and be more supportive through that process because I wasn't surprised by it. So I've been with kids coming out of anesthesia who have been very aggressive and they just kind of physically lash out at whoever's standing around. I've also been around kids who wake up and ask you, is it time for lunch? And there's really no visible uh, discomfort. So all of this information is going to be uh, compiled on the intake form in the clinic. And then this information is going to travel with the patient throughout his stay at the hospital. Um, and then I would encourage that as each team, if you find something that worked particularly well, that for some reason wasn't on the list, to just jot it down so that the next team that gets him has a, little, a step ahead. They, they have it a little bit better following your experience with the client. So that's the first item in the prep kit. Haley's going to talk about some of the other items in the prep kit. Okay, so the second item in the prep kit is going to be what we call a generic social story. And so most of, this, most of you, this is a new term for you guys. So what is exactly is a social story? A social story, it describes a situation or a skill or concept in a specifically designed format. Oh, by the way, you have a list of terms on the back of your, in the back of your packet as well. So if you need to refer back to those later on, you can also refer to those. Um, the purpose of this a social story is, so what it does is it takes an activity or um, a situation and it breaks it down and it goes step by step in a book format and you read that to the child. And so this is going to, the purpose of this is to reduce the anxiety for the child because as Jason has talked about, our kiddos, and I'm going to say our kiddos because that's kind of my kiddos, um, our kiddos, what we do is they like sameness, they don't like anything out of sight of their routine. They don't like unpredictability. They want to be able to predict what is going to happen on their day-to-day, minute-to-minute, second-to-second life, okay? So what this social story is going to do is it's going to give them um, the ability to see step-by-step step what's going to happen. Um, how it's used is typically it will be given to the family and then the family will be reading it with the child several times a day every single day that leads up to their actual visit to the hospital. Um, 
how it's going to impact a patient's experience is it's going to prepare them for what they need to expect, what they're going to be, some of the things that they're going to encounter, the places they're going to encounter, the items they're going to encounter. Um, it's also going to, the procedure, it's, it's not going to be completely new to them because they'll be able to have read it over and over and over and be like, oh, hey, that's the room I'm going to go into, or oh, that's the next person, the next room I'm going to go into. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you what our generic social story. So this will be given to the family. And so here is our social story. Going to the hospital. The sliding door will open so I can walk in. As you're going to see, things are very simplistic. The words are very simple and to the point. Not a lot of words going on. You'll see there's pictures for every single step. So some of us are like, oh my gosh, it's like a 35-page book. However, to a child with autism, every picture and every page is going to help them prepare so they know what to expect when they get here. I have to check in at the desk, so this is somebody that I might see. I will ride in the elevator, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. It just depends upon the child. I have kids that like to ride escalators up and down and up and down and up and down, so they just keep going and going. I will go to my room while my parents sign papers. So as you'll see, the words that are being used is it's instructing the child as to what he or she will be doing as they're going through each process, each step of the process. My mommy will sign the papers. Mommies typically sign the papers, so that's why mommy. <laughs> it can be interchanged with daddy. It doesn't matter whoever signs the papers. Um, and the other thing is, is as the parents are reading this to the child, they're going to be describing it. So they're not just going to read, my mommy will sign the papers. They're going to be like, mommy's going to sign the papers, daddy's going to be right here with you. Look, we're going to be sitting right there. So they can improvise and get and elaborate on it. So it's not just them just saying the one sentence. I will walk to my room, all you lovely faces waving. <laughs> the nurse wants to see how big I am. I need to stand on the scale. It won't hurt. So you'll see we're adding other language in there. It won't hurt. This is not going to hurt. So that they know, OK, that scale it looks mighty scary. I don't know if I want to get on it. But wait a minute, it's not going to hurt. If I'm scared, I can stand on a special scale in my room. So it's giving them an alternative. It's giving them a choice. I need to change my clothes into the lovely outfit that we have. The nurse will take my temperature. The nurse will put a wrap around my arm and give it a squeeze. It might feel like a hug. It won't hurt. Again, we're trying to um, pair, you know, the squeeze is going to feel like the hug, but it's not going to hurt. It's going to feel more like a hug. The nurse will put a light on my finger. It won't hurt. Again, you're going to see a lot of repetitive language. That's very, very important. The more repetition we can use with our kiddos, the better it is. The nurse will listen to my heart. The nurse will look at my teeth. I get to touch the mask. It feels like a soft balloon. It won't hurt. I will practice putting the mask on my face. It won't hurt. The nurse will put on my bracelet. The nurse will ask my parent lots of questions and type on the computer. I may need to drink some medicine. I will drink the medicine from a syringe. There are no pokes, and it won't hurt. After I take my medicine, I can drink yummy soda or apple juice, hopefully. <laughs> I might need to get a poke. I need to stay very still. I get stickers after. This would be where the parents would improvise more. And so if stickers aren't what the child would want, they could always throw in whatever that special reward or motivational item is in there. The nurse will tape my IV. I won't touch it or try to take it off. Great job not touching it. So we're also throwing in positive praise statements of great job not touching so that they know what they should be doing during that time. I will meet the doctor. They need to ask a lot of questions too. They will listen to my heart. I will meet the OR nurse. <laughs> Everybody's laughing at their pictures. She will check my bracelet and chart. I will go for a ride on my bed. I will stay on the bed and I won't try to get off. Again, another directive of what we would like to see them do during that point. Time for hugs and kisses. My mommy can only go to the red line. My mommy or daddy can only go to the red line. I will see my mommy soon. I will go on the bed. 
I will put on the mask like we practiced. My mommy will talk to the nurse while I'm asleep. I will sleep a little longer. My mommy will be with me while I'm sleeping. When I wake up, I get a yummy popsicle. The nurse will listen to my heart. The nurse will check my blood pressure again. The nurse will check my temperature. The nurse will take out my IV. The nurse will take off my bracelet. I get to ride in the wheelchair to my car. All done, good job, time to go home. Woohoo, we're done. So that is the example of the generic social story. So that will be involved, that will be included in the prep kit, prep, prep kit that will go back to the families. Um, now, the second social story we have is going to be titled a staff social story. And what that is, is it's the same type of social story that we just looked at. Um, however, the purpose is to show the patient who they may see the day of surgery. Now, I know that you're thinking, well, there's a lot of us, and they may not even see all of us, they may not even see one of us, or they may see a couple, but the point is to at least give that child or that patient um, experience with looking at the people they may encounter. So that way, hey, maybe they see two out of the 10 faces, they may recognize, they may feel a little bit more comfortable when they see that. So, and our kiddos with autism are absolutely amazing. They are visual kiddos. They are visual learners. If you can put anything in a visual and show a picture, they will catch it like that. So we're, that's one of the reasons you're gonna see a lot of the things we're gonna be using are visual techniques. Um, so it's going to impact the patient's experience because it's going to ease anxiety again. Because as we know, the hospital's busy, there's lots of people coming and going, transferring, going here, and they're gonna be able to be a little bit familiarized with some of you guys. Um, okay, so the next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna show the staff social story. I have to give, um, I have to preface it with, not everybody's picture is in here, so if you're not in here, please go see Shelly. And I also have to say, if you don't like your picture and you want it photoshopped, go see Shelly. <laughs> so it's all changeable. We can all change it. It's, it's not, not a final thing. <laughs> OK, so this is the second social story. So my visit to the hospital. When I take my tour of the hospital, these are the people that I will see. So the next thing after we talk about um, the prep kit, we're going to talk about the private tour. So here are the people we may see. If your name's spelled wrong, go see Shelly. <laughs> when I get to the hospital, these are some of the people I may first see. I may see first. So as you can see, there's a lot of pictures. And so you're thinking, this is overwhelming for me, let alone my kiddo with autism. However, the parent needs to take time and go through each person and just go through it. So this isn't going to be something that's going to take two minutes to read. There's more people and even more people. Here are the people who will make me go to sleep. And more people. <laughs> These people will pick me up and wheel me away. And more. I might see these people when I wake up. So again, as the parent is reading this, they're going to go through each person. More. Everybody find yourself. Remember, see Shelly if you don't like the picture. <laughs> and that's the end of the staff social story. So as you can see, we're going to, in the prep kit, there's going to be two social stories. There's going to be the generic one of what their hospital visit will look like with the generic things, step-by-step -step process. And then they're also going to get the staff one of the people that they're going to encounter. So hopefully when they come and see you that day, they're going to recognize you. It may not be like, oh, you're great old friends and they're so comfortable with you, but at least they'll have seen your face and they'll be a little bit familiar with you. So that'll ease a little bit of their anxiety. And then Jason's going to take over. And so I think one of the important things to remember is that they're going to know your face. So don't be surprised if they decide to greet you on a first name basis the first time they see you. Because I've seen it happen going through family photo albums, for example. They see their great aunt for the first time, and they address them by first name. 
and it's as if they've been known each other all their lives. Other times it's not going to matter so much. But again, it reduces novelty. It's not going to be the first time they've ever seen you. So once they've done the clinic, they've come in, they've been identified for surgery, they've gotten their prep kit, which has the social stories, the intake form is completed, they're going to get a private tour. Um, the private tour, and I, I believe this is a new acronym to the hospital, but I'm not entirely sure. We have a private tour guide who is going to uh, receive the intake form, contact the family, and on Thursday afternoons, they're going to bring the family, mom, child, mom, dad, and child, into the hospital and kind of walk them through. So they've, they've had this social story that they've been looking at. They've been looking at pictures of people and places. Now on a Thursday afternoon, they get to come in and they get to see it in real life. This activity is gonna give a lot of feedback to the private tour guide as far as how this is gonna go. If they seem pretty comfortable, if they walk through and they seem kind of excited, it doesn't mean everything's gonna be smooth sailing, but it's a good sign. It's a good sign that they're comfortable and that they've been practicing the social stories and that things are, are moving the way we want them to go. It's also going to be a great time to discuss with the parents and verify, I know this will be a surprise, parents don't always tell the truth. So sometimes on that intake form, they might write something in the privacy of their own home and then when they get to the hospital and you see the kid and you see the intake form, you might think, this can't be the same kid. So this will be eyes on the target, so to speak, an ability to see the kid and just ask mom or dad. Maybe the other parent, the one that didn't fill out the intake form, is there for the tour. I've often found that when you make a statement, I've, I've heard one story from mom for the first five visits, and on the sixth visit, maybe it's a Saturday and dad happens to be home, and I just repeat something that I've heard a million times from mom, and all of a sudden dad says, wait, 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 that's not exactly how it goes. And then there's a little bit of a variation, a little bit of a different story. So this will be a good time to verify with mom, dad, and with your own eyes how valid the information that's on that intake form is. And if the child's verbal, you can ask them, oh, so I hear you like spicy hot Cheetos. They might light up and say, oh, they're my favorite. Or they might go, eh, in which case you might want to probe a little bit more and see, does mom just think he likes them or does he actually like them? Um, so we're going to keep it to one person. The private tour guide is also going to be the one to call, complete all the data stuff that goes in prior, prior to surgery. Um, this is also to reiterate the use of the social story, how it works, how often it needs to be practiced and reviewed, and also to determine what items are gonna go in the prep kit. And correct me if I'm wrong, because we've kind of gone back and forth on this, but it's definitely gonna be an intake form, it's definitely gonna be the social stories, and there might be additional items in the prep kit based on the needs of the child. So not every prep kit is gonna be exactly the same. They're gonna be kind of specialized based on the procedure the child's having and what areas of the procedure the child might have the most difficulty with. It's also gonna give us a chance to see what the, the stressors were identified on the intake form. They've been looked at in pictures, but this is gonna be a chance to actually see the kid around the stressors and see how they handle it. Um, they're gonna feel the hospital gown, the squeeze of the blood pressure cuff, cold stethoscope, surgical tape, unknown faces. All of this is going to be real life to them. It's all going to be happening in front of their face. And so we'll get a chance to see how prepared they are. If what we've put in place has worked so far, it should be relatively uneventful. If it hasn't been working, chances are the parents haven't been practicing or something might have been mislabeled, and, and we've got to kind of back up and review again. So Haley's going to talk more in detail about the preparation kit. Okay, so our preparation kit, um, when the patient goes to the clinics, they're going to receive their intake form, um, and they will also receive the generic social story, which we just went over, of the hospital visit, and also the staff social story. Then um, there are more things that we are going to add to the prep kit that they will get to take home. However, that's going to be given at the private tour. And that's because um, the private tour guide will be able to talk with the patient and their family and get more of an idea of what actually needs additional items that need to go home along with um, the generic social story and the staff social story that they already have. So. Um, the preparation kit, the purpose of that is that it's um, a box of items, um, some that were given in clinic and then some that are given at the private tour, that are meant to prepare the patient for surgery. 
Um, so there's how it's used is it's given to the patient. Um, also in there are instructions to the parents on how to practice with certain items. We're going to be going through what the items are in just a moment. Um, but there are directions on how the family needs to practice with um, the child for the different things. Um, it's going to impact a patient's experience because it's going to give them exposure to those items that they're going to come in contact with that day. As I had, as I had mentioned earlier with the generic social story, and the staff social story, um, the parent is going to read those and go over with those, goes over those with the patient every single day, multiple times a day. That's the same thing that they're going to do with the prep kit items. Because the more practice we give our kiddos, the better the experience it's going to be. So if we practice with putting on a gown every single day or a couple times a day, then when they get here, your job's going to be a lot easier because they're like, oh, I know what this gown is. I can put it on. I'm okay. The texture, I'm fine with. Um, certain things like that. So it's going to make it a better experience for them because they're going to be able to um, already have had access to those items. So it's not going to be something new. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to have issues or they're not going to be uncomfortable when you get to certain steps of the process, but we're trying to be proactive and prepare them as much as possible when they get to those specific steps. So again, um, just reiterating, the SAF social story and the generic social story are the ones that are given in the clinic with the intake form. Then when they get to the private um, tour, and also the homework sheets for the parents are also given in the clinic. And that is where the directions are given on how often to practice and what to do with each item in the kit. Then at the private tour, the rest of the items are given. So a gown will be given so that they can practice putting on and taking off a gown. Socks will be given a blood pressure cuff, um, again the social story, one about the process, and then the staff social story, and then any other items um, that the private tour guide after they have you know, spoken with the family feel that the family needs. If, um, okay, excuse my terms, if it's sticky tape that they know that their child is going to have an issue with, maybe some of that can be given. If it's, um, you know, we're not going to be giving out needles, but if it's something that they can maybe come up with to try to help the family practice with, you know, if they feel that their child's going to have really a hard time with needles, then that would be something. Um, so that can be anything. So these are just kind of the generic things that will be given in every prep kit, um, but it all depends upon that actual tour and if there's anything added that will help the family. Um, I know, Shelly, we've talked about a future thing is going to be a CD of hospital noises. So hopefully in the prep kit will be a CD of different noises that the child will encounter because a lot of our kiddos, you know, have those sensory issues and a lot of the um, noises can be very overwhelming for them. So that's something that eventually we're going to be able to put in the prep kit. And then we also will give them access to the short video, which will be available via your website. Um, it's coming soon and that's kind of just an overview of the hospital as well in the process. So that's also coming. Um, so these are the items that will be involved in the prep kit. All right, so the actual day of the private tour, they arrive. This, is, this needs to be scheduled two weeks prior to surgery because again, if all of our kids with autism learned from one trial, if they learned just by doing something once or seeing something once, they wouldn't be autistic by definition. So they need time. We need time to assess the situation as a hospital staff to see what it is that they need to practice, and then we need to give the, time, the family time to practice. Um, I have a kiddo right now who hospital socks are the coolest thing ever. Any family member goes to the hospital, all he wants to know when they get home is if he can have their hospital socks because to him they're very exciting, but he won't wear them. He just keeps them. He likes to collect them. Putting them on his own feet is a traumatic experience. Same with the gown. He hates the idea of having to take his clothes off anywhere other than his own bathroom in his own home. He gets his pajamas on in his own bathroom in his own home. He doesn't change in his bedroom. So if you're going to ask him to change into a hospital gown in a hospital setting, changing in a hospital setting is going to be tough enough. Let's let him practice the gown outside. So the two weeks will give the family hopefully time to get ready. Um, and as we've already said, I, mean, I think we've already covered most of this, they're going to have the pictures, they're going to know the staff, but everything will be visual to them. There's going to be, there's not a lot of verbal explanation. Even with our highly verbal kiddos who we might just be able to explain it to verbally, 
it's still important to give them the visuals. It's still important to utilize all the tools that we've mentioned so far. And the, the most key thing is going to be repetition. I can promise you right now that you will have families who will get the prep kit and they're not even going to open them. They're going to look at them and they're going to think, oh, this is overkill. I'm not going to do this. It's going to be a challenge. I would bet that only probably happens once. I bet the next time they're here, they'll probably make very good use of the prep kit um, because it really is the repetition and the familiarity that's going to make this work. Um, there's going to be a list of items that parents need to bring with them the day of the surgery. Clean gown, cuffs, socks, highly preferred items. Again, if the, if the kiddo has a particular toy, stuffed animal, blanket, whatever, that is significantly important to them, parents probably aren't going to forget those things. Those are usually the things that are first packed everywhere, but it can't hurt to remind them. If they utilize a PEX book or an iPad app or any other type of assistive communication device, we want to remind the parents, hey, make sure you bring that with them. And we want to know prefer preferred clear liquids and cup for post-op. Parents will receive a pre-op phone call one day prior to surgery. And if, if the system kind of breaks down, this might, as my understanding, might be the first time that autism is identified in the, in the situation. Um, so in that case, we're going to have them uh, fill out the intake form, notify security to place the, the Georgia's pass on their file. And um, if everything goes as scheduled, if, if this whole system works and they're identified by the surgeon at the beginning, we go through the clinic, we go through the whole process, the arrival time can be decreased from the standard hour and a half to a much more uh, patient-friendly amount of time. So once they're there, they're going to go through pre-op. As we've already talked about in the social story, I think you guys are well prepared for what happens next. They sign in at the security desk. They're going to have their George's pass, the, well, it's the thing that was on the front, the, the giraffe George um, and puzzle pieces logo. And they're going to be given schedule uh, priority. Once they get there and sign in, the, the intake person sees George's pass. They're going to call day surgery to let everyone know that it's time to go. The nurse will go down and pick up the patient and, again, hopefully, two family members. The nurse will drop off one parent to the registration where they fill out paperwork and the other <clears throat> and take the patient to the other and the other family straight to their room, bypassing the waiting room, bypassing the noise and other people talking and other kids crying. We're going to skip that step and go straight to a room. Again, in a lot of situations, sadly, two parents can't be available. So if there's only one parent available, they'll admit patient outside of pre the pre-op room with the goal of the patient going to a quiet room and bypassing the, the loud, noisy, distracting waiting area, decreasing, again, the potential stressors, decreasing the potential problems that we might have. Um, and then once in the room, the uh, nurse will do height weight with a portable scale if necessary. Vitals and monitor in the room. Patient may already have cuff and gown on from the prep kit. They might be ready to go already. If they're not, then we'll go through that uh, at that point. So each, we've talked about the clinic. The clinic has the, a prep kit of its own. Um, we've talked about that. Pre-op is the first stage of surgery, so to speak, and we have a separate toolkit for pre-op. So Haley's the genius behind the toolboxes. OK. So with our whole process here, um, we've talked about, thank you, we've talked about preparing, and it's all about preparing the child and, you know, um, trying to show them what's going to happen step by step so that they have less anxiety, they're more familiar. So that's all the preparation kit. But then once they get here, you guys are like, okay, so they've prepared, but what do I do with them now? You know, what, how do I communicate? How do I get my job done and take care of this patient, but yet make it a really good experience? So we've come up with what we call a pre-op toolbox. And it's going to look like this. You guys will all have a chance later on when we do the hands-on portion to 
have fun with all the fun toys and stuff that are in here. So the purpose of um, the purpose of the pre-op toolbox is it's a box of materials that are designed to assist with specific patient um, in that specific phase of or step of your process of surgery. Um, how it's used are there are various items in there. There's a couple different things that we have um, added in here that's going to help you guys with communicating to the patient. Um, no matter what type of communication they can do. So um, whatever their communication system is, if they're nonverbal, if they speak in one to two words, um, if they have a communication device, the items in this toolbox are going to help you guys communicate and be able to do everything you guys need to do. Um, again, we're going to go through this, but it, you're also going to see it's all visual. So there's a lot of pictures, there's a lot of icons, that's, that's what it's all about. Um, it's going to impact the patient's experience and it's going to make it better because it's going to make it easier for you guys to communicate what's going on in the process um, to that patient and that family. It's going to alleviate the anxiety for the patient because you're going to have a system of communication. Because I'm sure a lot of times right now, you know, you're getting a, a kiddo in there and you, you may know a little bit based off of what the parents have told you of how they communicate, but you, you're you might not feel totally comfortable interacting with that child because you don't know, well, if I do this, are they going to do this? Or if I do this, are they going to, you know, yell at me or scream or try to bite me or, you know, so this is hopefully going to give you some tools and extra things that you guys can do that's going to make the experience a little bit easier. Um, it's going to allow you guys to better assist the patient. It's going to allow you to have techniques that you can pull from um, in order to avoid issues. So behavior issues, um, communication breakdowns. So, so the contents of the pre-op toolbox, there are three things that are included. There is a first this, then that board, and I'm going to just briefly um, label them right here, and then we're gonna go into each one and how it works and the purpose of it, and um, you'll get to look at it. The second thing in that toolbox is a visual schedule, and the third item is distraction items or rewards. So the first this, then that board looks like this. In the toolbox, there's going to be this binder with George's pass on the front. The first then this board is going to be this, okay? What this is, is it's a tool that visually depicts the task to be completed and what is available after. So. In your toolbox, you're going to have a list, a variety of icons of all of the different steps in the process of what you guys need to do. You will also have various icons of rewards and things that the child will get to do that are included in the toolbox. So all of your rewards, stickers, bubbles, light up balls, all musical toys you can see on the table over there, there's a lot of different toys that have been purchased to go in there. All of that stuff will be in the toolbox as well. So for a first this and that board, the purpose of it is to take a picture of the item in which you want the child to do or the step in the process. So this one is going to be the scale. You put it first the scale, then you're going to get a little bouncy ball. So if you have a child that is completely nonverbal and that has to or communicates very simple and you need just very, very simple steps, you would pick your first icon, you would say first the scale, then the ball. So that's giving the child, hey, I just need to do this and then I get this. So you complete my step, I'm going to give you the reinforcer or the reward, okay? Um, this is going to impact your patient's experience because it's going to be able to provide a tool for you to communicate your steps in the process, but it's also going to allow you to, um, the patient to be able to expect what's going to happen. Also, with our kiddos, sometimes having them do five tasks in a row before they get something, a reward or a motivational item, that's too many steps. Sometimes it's only one step that they can do. They're on very thin schedules of reinforcement. So they're used to just 
doing one thing and getting something, doing another thing and getting something. It's all about positive reinforcement. So this is going to be a very simplistic thing for you, okay? The second thing in the toolbox is going to be a visual schedule. So this blue binder, everything you need for all these things is gonna be right in this blue binder. So it's really nice. You take the binder, you go with you, it's easy, you can flip through it, you can pull out your icons, take them off, Velcro them off, it's very hard too. So that way um, nothing's getting ripped, nothing's getting um, destroyed. Okay. So the visual schedule, what this is, is it is a tool used to indicate the steps in a procedure. So if you have, the first this in that board is just a tool used to indicate one step and then you get a reward. A visual schedule is something that you can add several steps to a procedure or to a process, then give them whatever the reinforcer or the reward is. It's a way for them, it's kind of like the social story, how it's a step-by-step -step process of what they're going to expect. That is similar to a visual schedule. This is what your visual schedules are going to look like. So this one is getting ready. And as you can see, all of these pictures are the ones that correspond with the social story that they were given. These are all, each of these pictures stands for an individual step in the process. Um, this is going to give the patient predictability so they know what they can predict. Um, and these can be used various ways. Again, in your binder, you're gonna have all the icons. We refer these as icons or pictures. Um, you're going to have all of those located in here because everybody, I know everybody has a specific process and things that need to get done, but some people do them in a different way. Some people do them in a different order. So this way, you guys as individuals can choose what order you're going to do these things in. It also depends upon how the child is at that state because you may be able to do certain things first and then you may have to switch it up and do something else. So this gives you guys flexibility because they come off and on instead of just saying, this is the way you're going to do it. This is the step you have to do it, now do it. Because not all kids are gonna be able to do it in that same process. So what you would do for your visual schedule is you would pick up your icons out of your binder and put them on your visual schedule in the order in which you wanna do. They're front and back side, so you can use all of the different icons and you can add more icons on there. One thing that you guys are probably thinking is, well, that's only five things you know, and then there's five on the back. The reason that the pictures are not shrunk is because, again, our kiddos are visual learners. Visuals are very helpful for them. So if the picture is this big, they might not be able to see that, or also you have to remember, they're gonna be in a different environment at that moment. So there's gonna have, they're gonna have anxiety as it is because they're in somewhere new, they're, you know, got things going on. So something that they can actually see and recognize is gonna be easier. So that's why they're bigger but we have done both sides. And there's also extra um, in here as well. So a visual schedule is something you're gonna need to do ahead of time. So before you walk in there to see the patient, you're gonna have to put in your schedule of what you're gonna want, okay? At the end, and then um, for now, this is what the, pre or the toolbox binder looks like. We are going to add the visual schedule of Velcro sheet here so that this can be taped to the front so that you can have a visual schedule on one side and you can have the first this, then that board on the other side. So it's all in one. So this will be something that you don't have to take out of here that you can just attach right on the front. Um, the other thing with the visual schedule is you can also add reinforcer or distraction items to it. So if maybe I want my patient or kiddo to go through these four steps and then they get a reinforcer or reward. So that's gonna be up to you guys. And part of the demonstration and part of the hands-on part, we're gonna teach you how to look at an intake form, look at um, the things that are written in there, and know maybe how many steps that child will be able to handle before they need to get a reward or a reinforcer. Okay, so that's all gonna be part of that. That's also... Is that for the more 
that depends upon that depends upon your patient so if you have a child that is more advanced that has more communication you will probably be able to do just a visual schedule and say we're going to do this we're going to do this then you're going to get this then you're going to do this and this and this if you have a child that is probably not as highly with communication skills not very good with communication skills you will want to use your first this then that board so these do not have to be used together they can be used independently. You can choose just to use one or choose to use the other, or you can use them together. So that was a good example. You can use your visual schedule and say, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, this, then you're gonna get this, and then you can change to your first this, then that board, and go step by step. But that is all gonna be how we're gonna teach you guys um, on the hands-on how to look at that intake form, acquire that information and be like, oh, a first this, then that board is probably gonna be the best means of communication with this patient, or, oh, well, it looks like they're probably gonna do really good with a visual schedule. The best part of it being all in one binder is that if you get in there and what you thought was gonna work is maybe too overwhelming, you can always flip it over and break it down to a smaller step. So it just kind of depends. So, you know, they, the parents give you this intake form and this is what's been working with them at home. Obviously when they come in the creation of anxiety, like we just probably answered it, we may have to adjust that, right? I mean, so yes. the anxiety can stop the number of steps that you can do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's gonna be, based on the intake form, Hopefully that's gonna provide you with a lot of information that you'll be able to pick the items that you're gonna use, but then it's gonna to have to be off the cuff as well because right when you get in there, it could be a completely, you know, or the kiddo could have a really bad day that day because we all have bad days, so it could be that. So hopefully we're giving you that information by having the intake form as detailed as it is, we're being able to get as much information as possible and then giving you these toolbox items, we're giving you different things that you can pull from. So it's not just like, here, this is the only thing that you get to use. So it's gonna be a matter of you guys trying to problem solve at that time as well. Okay. Um, the third thing in the toolbox is our distraction and rewards. As I showed you, we have pictures of our distractions rewards, reinforcers, there's several terms for it, so they're all interchangeable. Um, but along with the pictures, so the picture is to use on the visual schedule on the first this, then that board, just to indicate to the child this is kind of what you're working for, if you would want to say. Okay, you do this and this, and then you're going to get this. Um, we also are going to have stuff like bubbles and squishy balls. Um, there will be a dry erase board and dry erase markers to help you. There will be a variety of toys. Um, there's also, as I said, there's toys on the, that table over there, musical toys, things like that. Um, the reinforcers or rewards or um, uh, distraction items that are used, you're going to know what the right things to use are based off of the intake form because there is a section on that intake form that says, what are the things I like to do? This is also a time where if the parents brought in items, comfort level items, favorite toys, that one favorite car that Jason was talking about that you guys probably won't have in your box, but mom and dad would bring it in. Those are all items that you can use as well as part of your rewards and distraction items, okay? But we wanna give you some too, because as we all know, novel things are fun. So maybe your kiddo doesn't have this specific green bouncy ball, but likes bouncy balls. Or maybe a lot of our kiddos, bubbles is the thing. Bubbles, if you have bubbles, bubbles, chicken nuggets, and pizza pretty much are like the three things that, I mean, I don't know, maybe it should go in the diagnostic criteria, I don't know. But bubbles is a huge thing, so that's, that's the other thing. So what we're hoping you guys do is you take the information from the intake form of those reinforcers or those rewards that they like, and those are the items that you're going to use when you're trying to go through your step-by-step -step process. Um, what the goal is, and I'm sure that it is, because Shelly has all the pictures, she's taken thousands of pictures, I'm sure, every single reward item in here will have a corresponding picture so that you can use that icon on your first this, then that board, or on your visual schedule so that you actually have the item, okay? And then if you don't have the item in the box, that picture won't be in our nice little binder, so that way you don't put a squishy ball on there and go, first this, then squishy ball, uh-oh, I don't have a squishy ball, that's not good. So just make sure <laughs> you have the reward that corresponds with the picture or else you might have a behavior issue on your way. 
So the other thing that I just thought of is that you also have an idea from pre-op to post-op and recovery what didn't work. So some kids might have an issue with a certain texture of an item, or they might just really dislike a certain character. And if those things caused a problem for you in pre-op, they're probably that's probably an item that you want to lose the icon to before you get to post-op. You know, if you know that Dora the Explorer, for example, is a no-go for this kid for whatever reason, you don't want to be rubbing Dora under their face and saying, hey, what do you think? Do you want to play with Dora? Because the, the previous team already identified that doesn't work so well. So when we get to pre-op, again, the patient's asked to change into the gown. We're also going to ask them to lay down on the gurney. They've seen pictures of these things. We've talked about it a lot. It shouldn't be as stressful for them, but it's still a new experience. I'm sure most of you don't lay down on gurneys at home for fun. It's, it's, it's going to be novel. It might be novel good in that they're excited to do something that they've talked about, heard about, been thinking about. They might be really excited. They might still be kind of hesitant and scared. Um, but the nurse will review the toolbox items specific to the patient. So you might have distractor items. You might be using your first thin board. First, you're going to lay down on the gurney. Then I'm going to hand you a, I don't know, a, a ball that lights up. And that's, they jump on the gurney, you hand them the ball, then first we're going to wheel down the hallway, then we're going to, you're going to get a sticker. Whatever the case may be, you're going to be utilizing your tools throughout this process. <clears throat> if they're those preferred items, this would be the spot where they're being put in the box so the team has them. The nurse is going to review the intake sheet, use anything required, review the visual schedule with the patient if that's the tool that we think the kid's at linguistically and developmentally. We might have three things on that schedule. We might have five. We might have more. And again, it's just important, a general rule is to keep language to a minimum. We're going to be using, we're going to make sure we have their attention before we start talking to them because language might not be their strong suit anyway. And if they're looking at the lights and really fascinated by that while we're telling them to lay down on the gurney, they might not hear or attend to what we're saying. So we want to secure their attention and then use as few words as possible to tell them whatever it is that we need to tell them. Um, and then this is more medical stuff. We're going to verify the information that we have, make sure the data is accurate, the assessments are completed. We're going to verify any medications, uh, place the ID, sign consent, all the legal and technical stuff that make you guys awesome nurses is going to happen. If the patient is 12 years or older or greater than 50 kilograms, you may need to insert an IV. If that's the case, again, that's something that was in the social story. It's something that can be on the visual schedule. It's something that you can use a first then on. First, I'm going to stick this thing in your arm, and then I'm going to give you something that you like, or your hand, I guess. Um, the, the nurse will call anesthesia to report patient level of anxiety and cooperation. I would take that as kind of a courtesy. When I worked in schools, if I was bringing a kid back to a classroom and the kid was really agitated, I would send the teacher or the school psychologist or the speech therapist a text message just to let them know hey, Johnny's having a rough day today, just so you know, so that they have a sense of what they're walking into. So let the anesthesiologist know what's, what's happening. Um, obtain orders for sedation prior to start the IV if needed. If, if you're looking at the kid and you think there's just no way that this is going to happen, then sedation might be required. Again, use your toolbox. We're going to be using first thins, distractor items, visual schedules. If the kid seems like he's pretty amped up or you, in your professional judgment, feel like maybe this is more than I can handle solo, then secure additional staff if you need to have someone stabilize the arm. Um, again, the, the idea behind all of this, the goal is that the visual supports are going to go a long way towards making this easier. It's not a magic bullet. It doesn't mean that every kid's going to respond and that you're never going to have problems. I would hate for any of you to think that well, I did the visual schedule, and this kid is still very, very agitated, so I'm just going to go ahead and stick the IV in him. Not a good call. I mean, I think you'd realize that after you got punched, that maybe that wasn't the best call. But hopefully we're recognizing that beforehand and saying, you know, in my professional opinion, I like what we're doing. I think it's helpful, but I still want to have another body here just to, just to be sure. Um, again, if you're giving medication as a nurse, some kids take it in syringe form. Some kids can drink it out of a cup. Some kids swallow pills. Whatever needs to happen, you want to have that information available. Um, 
And sometimes it's very helpful to have the parent administer it if possible. If that's something that um, kids are much more comfortable and familiar, usually a lot of our kids are on some form of prescription medication. There's usually a ritual or a routine that goes along with it. A lot of the kids I work with, their meds go in applesauce and they get a spoonful of applesauce and the parents even say, they don't say, hey, Johnny, it's time to take your medication. They say, hey, Johnny, it's time for your applesauce. So he comes running to the counter to take his medication in applesauce. If you don't know those kinds of tricks, if you don't know how they prefer to do it, it could be a new novel wrinkle. But if you have that information, it can be helpful. Um, then last thing, I think, in pre-op is that you're going to check to make sure that everyone in the, in the, on the OR team knows that we're dealing with a kid with autism. Again, it should be on their file. The little George logo should be prominent. There shouldn't be any surprises. But you want to just make sure. Um, and then as they're going into the OR, we want to make sure that it, to notify if recovery needs to reserve a quiet room. Again, in the, the last time I was here with a kid, he was in a bed, and I think there were like eight other beds kind of in the room, and there were curtains around it. But you could hear a lot of noise, and there was a lot of stuff going on. And so we want to try to minimize that and, and have a, a quieter environment available. So they get to the ER, ER <coughs> anesthesia to assess the pac patient, explain plan of care and patient to the patient and answer questions that come up. The anesthe anesthesia says, okay, we're good to go. Um, if possible, the anesthesiologist and the OR nurse can arrive together so that you have new faces coming in as one new stimuli instead of having rapid fire, one person walks in, then another person walks in. Um, those quick changes in rapid succession cause a lot of anxiety. So if you think about it as an environmental change, two people coming in together is one big change to the environment instead of two quick little changes to the environment, so to speak. It's, ready, it's probably more beneficial to kind of pull the Band-Aid off and make the big change all at one time. Um, the OR nurse can introduce herself or himself to the patient and the family. You confirm ID bracelet and procedure on consent. You're going to review a visual schedule of what's going to happen. Because again, if the kid's going to be put uh, under anesthesia, he's going to probably lose track of some stuff while he's asleep. That, that's what we call it. When, while I'm asleep, mommy's going to talk to the doctors. So while he's asleep, we probably don't need anything on the visual schedule. But we want to have an identification of you're going to fall asleep. That's going to be a, a thing that happens. So we're going to set the visual schedule and review. Let him know what's going to come next. If he starts feeling groggy and he's not expecting it, he might fight it a lot more. He might get really agitated because all of a sudden he's not feeling normal. But if he sees the icon on the schedule that says, and then you're going to start getting sleepy, again, it's less foreign. It's less scary. This is what's supposed to be happening. This is part of the routine. And if you have uh, distraction tools, if you have a really novel thing in your box, or if mom brought something that um, is a particular fascination, um, this would be a kind of a good time to use those tools, to just give them something to do, take their mind off it. If they're thinking about looking at the shiny lights on their ball, then well, I guess it's the same for me as them putting a mask on me and telling me to count backwards from 10. The minute I get to 8, I'm out because my mind is not thinking about, I don't want to be asleep, or oh my god, what are they going to do to me? The kid's distracted, he's playing, and we're moving forward. Um, then the OR nurse will take the patient to the operating room on a gurney. Um, if the kid is still kind of agitated or if they're particularly large or for any reason you feel like it's not safe to the patient for one person to transport, you might need a second person. Um, some of the kids that I've worked with have been exceedingly large and it was just safer to have another person. Um, we're going to keep the parent at bedside until that red line and this is going to be a very, generally separations are very hard and very problematic, but mom can go with you up to the red line or dad can go with you up to the red line is going to be a thing they've heard a million times. And as you're approaching and you're wheeling them and if they're still, you know, awake and having a good time, point out the red line. Oh, look, we're coming close to the red line. Remember, at the red line, mommy's gone. Or first we're going to ride the gurney uh, the, and you're going to get your shiny ball. First we're going to get to the red line, then mommy has to leave on the visual schedule. So we're going to have all of that prepped. Um, and discuss whether or not it's appropriate to have the parent there as um, anesthesia is induced. And that's going to be a team decision. I mean, the parents are always going to have strong feelings, but 
also it's important to take into account the nurse's professional judgment as well as the anesthesiologist on whether or not that's a good idea. I have a client right now who mom's presence makes everything so much worse that if we could just get mom to take a few steps back, everything would be easier. But this particular mom is very much of a hoverer, so she always wants to be right in the middle of everything, and I think it stresses him out. So you, it's going to be your call. There might be a situation where you think, you know, just, just we got this. Or the kid's very uncomfortable. It's going to make our jobs easier if mom's right here. Then whatever happens in the OR room happens in the OR room. And when they wake up, <clears throat> they're going to be moved to recovery or post-op. They're going to be in the quiet room. The anesthesiologist will give a report on their level of, um, I'm trying to think of the word I was looking for, level of awakeness. I know that's not the right word. Level of alertness, I guess, is what I was going for. Um, take initial vitals and, assess and complete the assessments. Monitor leads, and, and we're going to put the side rails and everything back on the bed to make sure they don't roll out. Or depending, again, we ask the question, how do they do when they come out of anesthesia? That's an important thing. If you have bed rails and paddings back on and they wake up in not such a good mood, it's going to be much safer um, than the less chance of them banging on something and leaving a bruise or jumping up and falling off the gurney because they were in a hurry to go have chicken nuggets. Um, you're going to notify a pre-op nurse to pick up the discharge paperwork. Parents will be taken back to the recovery when airway is safe. And we're, you're on that walk, you're going to explain to the parents what to expect. Um, I've, been in, I've been with parents that have just kind of had an emotional overreaction. I shouldn't say that. To me, it was an emotional overreaction to seeing that their kid was just fine. I mean, I, I have great confidence in the medical field, so I expect my kid to be just fine <laughs> when we get to post-op. But I've seen some families who really just didn't think it was possible. And so letting them know what's going to happen, what state their child's in, sort of like we visually prepared the kid with social stories and first then and visual schedules. Verbally, you can kind of do that with the parent as you're walking them back. Everything went fine. I mean, most of you do this anyway, but just letting them know what to expect um, and what comfort level they're in. Maybe they're in pain and they're going to be grimacing and crying. Maybe they feel just fine and they want to go home and they're in a hurry. Always the goal is to have the parent present before the child's fully awake because if they wake up in a strange environment, and if I wake up in a strange environment, I overreact, I jump out of bed. If I sleep in, if I stay in a hotel room, I might wake up in the middle of the night and kind of jump out of bed because I'm not sure where I'm at. It takes my brain a minute to catch up and remind me. It's going to be the same except probably worse for an individual with autism who wakes up from anesthesia in a strange room with strange people standing over him. If the first face they see is mom or dad's, things are, much, are, are, are likely to go much better. And when the, when the patient is awake, in a perfect world, it'd be great if the minute their eyes popped open, we could just send them home. We're done. Everything's fixed. Goodbye. But that, to me, it's always felt like the longest part happens after the procedure. So we're done. We fixed whatever the reason was for you coming in. But now we've got to make sure you're OK. We've got to go through all the paperwork. We've got to make sure everything's good. So when the patient is awake, we can put together a visual schedule or a first then can be used to show patients what needs to happen before they get to go home because I think it's a pretty common belief that I'm awake, I'm done, it's time to leave. Not the case. So they're going to need to be able to drink something. They're going to be able to, you need to be able to remove the IV. They need to be able to sit up and not throw up or be nauseous, put them in the wheelchair, um, and make it to the car. Those would be the, the kind of the common steps to the end of post-op. And so again, our post-op and recovery, we're going to have a toolbox. Haley described in great detail the pre-op toolbox. The post-op toolbox looks just the same. It's the same box. It's a different binder. It might have slightly different items in it based on availability, um, but the same tools. We're going to be using a first this, then that board, visual schedule, distraction items, and rewards. The patient will be discharged, hopefully, from the quiet room, because remember, we took them from the OR to a quiet room. Hopefully, we're skipping post-op, and we're skipping all the areas where there's a lot of noise and congestion. Hopefully. They're able to jump in a wheelchair and be wheeled out to their car from a relatively quiet, controlled environment. This decreases the additional stimuli by avoiding another transition to um, a post-op area. It also eliminates introducing more people, um, 
another room, new equipment, all of that is bypassed by this procedure. And overall, the, the discharge is just a team effort. Um, the nurses do patient care, they do the teaching. If the patient can't be discharged from, recover, from a recovery or quiet room, then it was indicated to use a post-op isolation room versus a regular post-op bay, which I guess is where I saw the kid when there were a bunch of beds in there. Um, and again, throughout this whole process, we're using the communication tools. If the child uses, um, if they can speak to you, great, talk to them. You still want to use the visual supports as backup, but you, we want to make sure that we continue to communicate with the patient. If there's no pain or nausea, we can remove the IV as soon as possible. And after the anesthesiologist signs off, they have, family, uh, <clears throat> have the family bring the car to the entrance. This is standard operating procedure, I think, for most families anyway. Bring the car around, put patient in the wheelchair, Use distraction tools. This is generally my go-to things are, for me personally, I hand kids my phone all the time. I put it on airplane mode, turn on an iPhone, and I open an app, and I just hand it to them, and it's got all kinds of bright, shiny things on it, and they get really focused, and I can get a lot done in the time that they're exploring my phone. I don't recommend that for you, because I've had phones thrown off balconies, thrown in toilets. I've gone through a lot of phones, but in a pinch, it works really well. If somehow you got out and you've got no other distraction items, um, it works. Watches work really well and so do sunglasses. They're things that I always keep with me because I don't know why. Kids like them. They're novel. It's new. Um, so give them the distraction item. Wheel them out of the hospital. Again, always first, of course, make sure they're secure and safe in the wheelchair. So we've talk, we started off talking about autism and its characteristics. It's increasing at an incredible rate and every child whether autistic or not autistic, has need of medical care. Uh, this hospital, this facility is known throughout the country as being fantastic. So this is just hopefully steps we can take to maintain the reputation and also to allow for your facility, you as a professional, to be able to deal with these numbers that just keep increasing. So um, hopefully, you know, nothing is set in stone. We're very flexible. But we're going to now, we're going to take a break, let you guys stand up and stretch a little bit, and then we're going to move to a hands-on portion where we're going to be circulating throughout the room, giving demonstrations and answering questions. Um, but these are the things we want you to think about is, do you, do you think this process overall is going to make for a better experience? And what steps, what things, what did we do in this new process that are specifically tailored to address the needs of the autistic community population?